Father in heaven, thank you for the privilege we have to be here. You blessed us last night in a very profound way. You spoke to our hearts, and our simple prayer this morning is that you will do exactly that during this time together now. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us the incredible gift of healing and of restoration. And I just know that in a crowd this big, there's somebody here today who is experiencing some form of brokenness. Whether that's a marriage relationship, whether that is a parent-child relationship, whether that is just some personal instru- struggle on the inside that, that uh, has never been verbalized, if there is some form of addiction. Today we pray that a journey of healing would commence, that you do something profound in that person's life. There are also a whole group of us here that probably uh, we have already begun to experience healing. There's another group of us here this morning that are probably thinking, well, you know what, I'm pretty good already. I'm, I'm okay. This, this is probably not really that important to me. And I just ask that you would remove the scales from our eyes and that you'd enable us to see clearly, that you'd enable us to see beyond the obvious, the things that we feel may not plague us, the obvious things everyone always talks about, coming down to the very subtle things that, uh, that no one maybe talks about or that is even praised in our world today. I would ask that your spirit would bring conviction to our hearts, but more than just that conviction, the sureness of right and wrong, that you would also bring the healing that enables the new life. We need your grace, Jesus, and um, we need a healing that goes beyond pills, beyond medicine, beyond counseling, a healing that goes beyond positive thinking. We need a healing that gets right down into our hearts, that reorients us towards you. There's some here today who need to see you clearly, more clearly than they've ever seen before, and in that, there will be healing. So as Cherie takes the mic, we would simply ask that you would overshadow her and that you would accomplish your purpose in bringing us here together. In Jesus' name, amen. One more thing before Cherie comes up. Um, In fact, Cherie, you can come up so long. Uh, if there is an open space next to you, if you're in the middle, just squash towards the middle so we can see on the outside there's still some people in the foyer. If you're on the sides, and you, if you don't mind moving down so that basically we can see what's available for seating in the aisles, and uh, we can let some of those folks come in. So if you can squish, do that. Um, and Cherie, you want to come up? Yes. <laughs> so uh, last night I asked you a little bit about your family and where you're from. We uh, spoke a little bit about why you do this, why you keep coming back to this, even although you've escaped from it and, yeah. and uh, really your heart for people. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, your mother. I was intrigued by that last night because you said she handed you an essay that she had to write uh, as she was studying to be a social worker. Uh, then you kind of left me hung- hanging there. I- I'm thinking... What happened to your mother? Did yeah. she finish that? Is she a social worker? Is she in recovery? What, my what my mom actually went to back to school. My mom was incredibly bright, but I think she dropped school real early. Really bright, did well, got her social work degree, found out she didn't like kids. <laughs> I could have told her that. But, um, but what happened is when she got into the social work field, she worked with women that were from domestic violence situations and were trying to go back to school. So she was brilliant at what she did. The only thing is that most people live, uh, not most people, there are some people, and please raise your hand if you know of one or you are one, there's some people that can live completely different lives. They can go to work and have this life, and then they walk back home and they have this life. So my mom was never able to really separate those out. My sister's still making meth in the, in the bathroom. My mom's still doing prescription drugs. My, her boyfriend is still smoking weed. But she went to work and actually had a brilliant career and, um, and um, did really well with the programs that she established. Um, so I think that my sadness for her is I wanted to, you can't shake someone into recovery. Don't you want to just grab them and say, come on, <laughs> do it, let go of that stuff? And you can't do that. As much as you love someone, it has to be a personal decision that they make and step in. So um, um, to this day, my mom is still breathing. I still have incredible hope. And, um, but she, 
Um, she lives both worlds, and she lives both worlds really well. One more question, and maybe maybe you're already going to answer this in detail in the message this morning, but you've mm -hmm. been working with people in recovery. You've been in recovery for many years now. Um, you've seen some people make it. You've seen some people not make it. What is there something you can distill down to, you know, what makes a difference between a person who makes it in recovery and a person who doesn't? Is there a way to... Today's teaching. All right. If you get this... It's, uh, it's, uh, it's almost, you know, there are things that, like when you decide to be a cyclist and you're going to get a bike and you're going to go whatever, you're not going to do 100 miles in that day. But, man, it matters that you put your, your bottom on that seat. Do you know what I mean? First thing is you got to get the bike and you got to sit on it. And so this is kind of that basic thing. With this foundation, it's huge. Um, you can't do 100 miles on a bike if you never buy a bike. You can't do recovery if you never get this. Uh, and I really believe it's that important. Awesome. Good. Over to you. Thank you, Yeah, sir. okay. So, you know, what's really interesting, for, raise your hand if you weren't here last night. I, I knew that was going to happen. The only thing I can say about last night, I told the whole story, but I'm an addict in recovery. I was 10 years on the street, strung out on heroin. What I saw when I was on the street at 13 is I stepped into a city that had 80 thousand kids on the street like me. Um, they were funneled into industries that are really dark, and what they saw in life was ugly. When I found God, I was so, I, I was just beside myself. Are you kidding me? There's hope. Are you kidding me that I can have a life? What if, you know, my favorite song actually is the song that was played during the offering. He knows my name. <sighs> There's a God in heaven that knows my name. You know, and he says, you know what, I promise you, you'll be safe. And, and so I stood up and learned to read and went back to school, and I was so ridiculous. Every single day felt like God woke me up and wanted to kiss me on the face. Can't wait to show you today, you know. And I just felt so loved and so taken care of by him. And 10 years or so into my recovery, I ended up getting a nursing degree, started working in hospitals, and it was fun. I, I did so... I, I loved what I did. There are some people that come from some pretty injured places, and we get to step in, into fields that we get to bless other people. And every day is like a gift to us in our recovery. I loved what I did. But I love what I did so much that I got to be the Grand Marshal in the Fourth of July Parade. <laughs> you know what I mean? I got, I got a certificate from the mayor, citizen of the year. And I'm thinking, how funny, because I wasn't telling anybody. I'm a heroin addict in recovery. My sister has a porn site on the Internet. My other sister is a stripper. I mean, all that stuff. I wasn't saying anything. All I was saying, I'm a nurse. I'm married to a professor at the university. Um, his dad's an ambassador for the United States. My husband, who I talked about last night, we did get married. We've been married now for 27 years. And, and you know, all of my life was just so, it was so ridiculously, um, it was a miracle. It was so ridiculous. I loved everything. But one time, um, I got offended at the church because there was a few judgmental people at my church. Raise your hand if you can relate to that. Okay, so there was, and, 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 and I was just, I got offended, and I left, and, um, and um, I left for a long time, and I, and, and I remember God saying, you know, I want you to go back, and I thought, no way, I am not going back. I'm so not going back. They don't get me. Has any addict ever felt like nobody gets us? They don't get me. I don't fit in. I don't even know how to do normal conversation at potluck. I don't know how to, I don't know how to talk. I don't know how to socialize. I don't fit in. Nobody invites me home for lunch. You know what I mean? And I just thought, you know, I just, I, it, it's just too painful. And so, um, you know, I heard God say again, get back there. Because we're going to find a lot of people that will help us on our journey that are different than us, but they're going to speak into our lives. So he's saying, get back there. So I finally decided to get back there. And it was so funny. Pastor, come up here for a minute. <laughs> so, so I go back, and I am dying. I'm dying. I don't want to come back. I don't, I don't want to talk with you. And it's just like I am. And so I'm trying to be nice, but I'm thinking every time I stop, I think, oh, man. I just. And, and so finally I said, God has told me to come back to church. Um, but I, if I come back, I'm going to tell you everything that I ever did because I'm tired of hiding. 
Has anybody gotten tired of hiding? I'm tired of hiding. It's killing me to try to pretend I'm somebody I'm not. It's killing me to try to pretend I know how to be normal. I don't. And, and the pastor is really nice. Like you, He looks at me and he said, yeah, go ahead. And he's got this love in his face. And I'm like, oh, shut up. I'm going to tell you everything that my grandmother ever did. <laughs> do you know what I mean? And I'm like, I'm like, he's so nice still. And I'm thinking, my uncle's strung out. I mean, everybody in our family, my un- one of my uncles just died as a transvestite waiting for a sex change operation while his liver was shutting down. So I'm going to tell you all that. Yeah, and the, the love was still there, and I'm thinking, okay, so I just went, no, 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 and on, and on, and on, and at the end, I looked at him, and he had tears in his eyes, and he said, I would be honored to have you in my church. I wept. I wept. I thought, after you heard all that, and he said, I'd be honored. He knows I wanted to be rebaptized. He said, I would be honored. And I just couldn't believe it. He said, but would you do me a favor? And I thought, anything. Because when somebody gives you a gift like that, I've never belonged anywhere in my life. And this one statement by this man said, you belong here. Don't let anyone ever. If somebody judges you, it's on them because it's not God. And he was so clear about that. I just thought that my life was just handed to me in such a beautiful way. And he said, would you do me a favor? And I said, anything. What? So will you tell the church what you just told me? <laughs> I'm like, shut up. <laughs> There's no way. Thank you. There's but, but, but we've got to say praise the Lord, eh? Amen. Yeah, amen. Amen. So he's like, would you tell the church what you just told me? And I said, no. I haven't even told my mother-in-law. Remember, <laughs> I said my father-in-law's an ambassador for the United States. They wonder why my parents weren't at the wedding, you know. Um, but, I mean, it's just ridiculous. I haven't told a lot of people. I'm just telling you because I'm just coming back and I'm not going to hide. And he looks at me, it's real cheesy, because pastors have this thing that they'll say it's really funny, and they'll give you a half smile, and they look at you, and they say, why don't you just go home and pray about it? <laughs> and I'm thinking, that is cheesy, because even if God tells me, I am never telling this story anywhere. I went home, I'm telling my husband, nah, 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 the pastor said this, and, and my husband is not even a Christian at the time, because I met him when I had left the church, and and um, he says, well, why wouldn't you tell your story? And I said, we'd never get invited to potluck again. <laughs> you know, people won't like you, and, they, you know, they're going to judge you, and, and I, I've got rejection issues. And he just looked at me as a non-Christian and said, you, do we tell our story to each other to be liked or because it is what God asked you to do? And I thought, what do you know? You're not even a Christian. <laughs> And I go in the room, and I start ranting and raving at God. Um, You can't possibly want me to say this. You can't possibly. I mean, I want to be so badly like everyone else. You know, I want to be good. I want to be loved. I want to come from a home where I was wanted and so that my mom tried to self-abort. I want those things more than anything. And I'm going to stand up and say that not only did I not get that, but this also happened, and this is what I was redeemed from. I said, I, I just went on and on. I can't do that. And God finally said, through the Holy Spirit, it was the most in- incredible thing I've ever heard, is he said, every time you tell your story and every time I tell mine, it vindicates God. And, and I, you know, for an addict, what does vindicate mean? It tells the world that God is still capable of healing us. God is still God. It's not about us. I don't care what we put on the table. He said, I promise you, if you surrender to me, repent, do what you need to do as far as forgiveness, and I literally will wash that, clean it up, and if it's appropriate, give it back to you. Somebody says, if I surrender my sexual addictions, will I never have sex again? No, no, no. (laughs) You know, he'll clean it up change your desires and give you back who you are intimately. And so I just thought, I just got all that, called my pastor and said, Pastor, (laughs) 
I think God wants me to tell my story. And I could feel him smiling over the phone, like, I know, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we set up the story and um, the testimony time, and I came into the church. And the first time I got up, I thought nobody would ever talk to me again. And, and when I got done telling my story, I held and cried and cuddled every single person in that building. We need to tell our stories to each other. We need to stop being shamed by them. We need to stop being afraid to open up. Because in reality... We are our stories, and I need, to, I need to see who you are before I can hold you. You need to see who I am before you can hold me. And once we get past that stuff, healing happens. Then somebody says to me, and we're going to get into today's um, thing is on forgiveness, but somebody says to me, Do you, we should write a book. Well, I was illiterate at 23. I can't write anything. And so they hired a writer. And let me see if I can pick out somebody that they hired. Um, how about... Um, Red jacket. Yeah. So they hired a writer and sent him to my house. No, no, not the guy. Female jacket. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And so this person came up, born and raised a Christian, has never seen this lifestyle at all, and she walked up and I thought, no, no. <laughs> um, and so I said, have you ever been a stripper? <laughs> no. Okay, just curious. Um, <laughs> been homeless, drug addict, and she said no to all that stuff, right? So I sent her to L.A. to hang out with my sister all day at work. So I thought at least she'll get a sense of how to write, right? And she came back, and, and she just looked stunned, like traumatized. And, and I thought, you know, I got on my knees, and I said, God, I can't have her do this. For one, th we can't even talk about this, the world um, in which I came back from. Because for one, and thank God, she just doesn't get it. And I don't get her world. Do you know what I mean? And so I said, I'm sorry, um, I have to fire you. And so she, <laughs> and she left. She was not really happy with me, you know, because you're not a writer. Who's going to write it? And I started crying, got on my knees, and I said, God. And he said, how about if I help you write it? And I thought, but I'm not a writer. And he said, well, I've written a book before, and it's doing okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, trusting God, it was the most incredible healing time ever. But if you ever get a chance, this is the original cover. Um, they gave it to a graphic designer, wouldn't let me have say on the cover. Um, but th this is a cover of the first book that I wrote. The new cover is different. But the first book, if you are an addict at all, this looks like Ken and Barbie doing drugs. <laughs> And it's so clean and so beautiful. There's like um, um, four lines of coke in front of each of the people in their beautiful silk dresses on a table that has no drug paraphernalia, no anything, which if you're an addict, you know that that's crazy. The table is mahogany with no scratches on, and they've got razor blades chopping stuff up. And the amount of drugs here would kill each of those people if they did them. Most addicts that look at this said, is that heaven? <laughs> you can do as much drugs as you want. You have a nice table. Uh, no, no, no. And this motorcycle group right here um, killed and raped a 13-year-old girl till she couldn't scream anymore because her lungs were filling up with fluid. But when you look at this three guys, it looks like Easy Rider. You know, and I kept saying, can we change a cover because nobody's going to buy this. So if you want to look at this, I just bring it because I think it's interesting. But we went from writing this book to getting into a worldwide ministry. Worldwide ministry, working all over the world. Um, I went to Thailand rescuing kids in the sex trade industry. The youngest prostitute I held and got into a safe house was two years old. We went to places where the, the, the abuse was intense. And you know the only thing I had to tell them is your life can change. And there is a God that sees you and loves you. And they would look at me like, that can't be true. It is true. Why does God love us? I don't know. Why did he love me? I don't know. I absolutely had nothing to offer him. And um, the only thing I needed was a Savior, and that's what I got. So anyhow, so did ministry all over the place. And as at one point, I was working in a place called Willimantic, Connecticut. Willimantic, Connecticut um, is called Heroin Town. It's the largest trafficked place in the United States for heroin. And I was working with a guy named Randy Maxwell. Randy Maxwell is my pastor, but he also is an international prayer evangelist. The guy is amazing. And he asked us to work as a team. Every three months, we took a team in. We're working the entire city. The mayor gave us $50,000 to do the work we were doing because it was 
being effective with the addicts we were working with. And we were doing this kind of outreach that was amazing with seven different churches, three Adventists, one Pentecostal, Calvary Chapel, and Vineyard, I think. So it was a number of churches were involved. We were networking the community. We were setting up this program. It was so amazingly fun. We were working with prostitutes and drug addicts and all that kind of stuff. And even there's a hotel downtown. And the hotel was called Hooker Hotel. <laughs> Who do you think lived there? I know. I looked at that and I said, can we change the name of the hotel? <laughs> And I'm, I, I'm talking, I don't know who I talked to. And the mayor finally says, no, J.R. Hooker founded the town. <laughs> and I think, I don't even care. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's morphed into something else. We need to get the name changed. But anyhow, so we, we ended up, they actually gave us permission to change the name. But in the meantime, um, I went to the doctor on one of my trips home, and I got diagnosed with hepatitis A, B, and C, Right? I'm homeless 10 years, I'm a heroin addict, I've stuck needles in my arm that I have found in trash cans, that I literally took sandpaper to make them sharp so I could use them. I don't know who used it before me, and that's the way life on the street was. And so the fact that I had that was not a shock to me. What was a shock to me is when he said, I need to test your husband. What? I need to test your child. And I just wept because I'm in recovery for years now. I haven't done a drug for years now. I, I get it that I may have consequences, but not my husband. I can't give him this. The only crime he has ever done is love me. That's it. And I just cried. And uh, they had to bring Brad in, and they had to bring Jackie in. I birthed her. So more than likely, if um, she has hepatitis, she'll die of liver cancers, and, and it will be because of my history and and I mean we just wept and um, they tested everybody and everybody um, was clean nobody had it I wanted to move out of the house they said you're not moving anywhere <laughs> but um, I was just so it was such a crazy time but I got back to Willimantic and they found out that I got diagnosed with the hepatitis A B and C and all the churches got together and decided to pray for me right I didn't want prayer it was weird they said, can we pray for you? And I said, no, no, I'm good. Really? Pastor said, can I pray for you? And I said, no, 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 but we're doing this today. Let's pray for that. No, we're praying for you. And I felt like I was a child, like I was going to pout. Like I wanted to scream. I said, no, and I'm okay. I'm good. I don't want prayer. You know, and when you get seven churches and leaders from the, each of these churches involved and they say they're going to pray, they will not stop at that because you're crazy. Get up here, you know. And so finally, I stomped my way up there. And, and I don't know what church you're from, but some churches, when they say, can you pray for you? Two minutes later, you're done. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's not a big deal. Some churches do not stop hours later. <laughs> They're still going on. And so there was a few of those churches in there, and I thought, I know that if I get up in that circle, it could be ours, and I don't want prayer. And uh, the only thing I knew for sure is it was such a strong feeling. I don't want it. And so um, uh, I couldn't get out of it. They're praying like crazy. Finally, one woman is crying, and she says, well, what do you want prayer for if it's not physical healing? And I said, maybe the emotional stuff. Raise your hand if your emotional stuff is much more painful than what you carry physically. So maybe the emotional stuff. And she started praying for that, and I felt like I healed from the bottom of my feet to the top of my head. And I thought, I told you I did not want this. And I was so angry. And I thought, you know what? This is not fair because somebody may want healing. It is not me. And if you confuse, and, and I'm just wanting to scream and yell. And I don't want to tell anyone because if somebody says amen, I'll have to hit them right in the face. I was so mad. And I'm just like, <sighs> and, and I feel like, Cherie, this is crazy for you to feel this way. But I wasn't mad at the diagnosis. I didn't feel anything with the diagnosis. But with the healing, I just felt like, nah, you can't do this to me. And I go back home. I get my blood work done again. My doctor doesn't even want to do it at first. If you're a doctor, raise your hand. You don't heal from hepatitis C. You know what I mean? You can't come in one, one um, year and get tested and go through all that kind of, and if you're on and looking at all that possibility and then come in and it's just gone. And he said, Cherie, 
it's not gone. And I said, it's gone. Just test me. The insurance is not going to cover it. Just test me. And he tested me. I have nothing. Who said amen? Are you not hearing me? (laughs) So I am like, so now I have to go home and tell my husband, you know, it's gone. And my husband is going to cry. He's going to say amen. And I'm just going to be furious. I don't want to tell anyone because you know what? This is not fair. I didn't ask for this. I didn't want this. And I finally, three months of just complaining to God, and I finally said to God, even I know this is absolutely crazy. And I heard the Holy Spirit say, Cherie, you have wanted to die every day of your life since I was a little girl. And you saw this as an out. But I'm going to ask you today to choose to live. And I just wept. I just wept. I don't know how to do that. I don't want to hold another molested kid. I don't want to work with all this kind of stuff. I don't want to get up and process my own stuff again today. Because you know what? Every day I have to look at something. We're on that sanctification. I'd rather be asleep. You wake me up and let's just go home. And he said, you know what? A day is a thousand years to God. I heard a pastor say that. Days a thousand years. Any mathematicians in the group? If I live 80 years and a day is a thousand years to God, how long is that in my life? It's like an hour and a half. So God says, for the next hour and a half, whatever you have to carry, will you carry it for me? And I just wept and finally said yes, and my entire life changed my entire life, I will choose to live. Um, It's a choice I make. In the midst of my struggles, in the midst of a storm, in the midst of a crazy thing. My my daughter got molested by her Bible teacher in a Christian school. Um, That was the hardest four years I've ever went through. My daughter tried to kill herself, and again, I just chose to live. Because my recovery dictates that. God dictates that. But not because things are easy. So anyhow, so I ended up going through all that kind of stuff. Literally making choices about recovery and and healing and and getting through that hard stuff. And what do you do with anger? And what do you do with depression? And what do you do with joy? Every time I felt joy, you know what happened? Everything was good. And I'm like, ah, this is amazing. What's going to happen? Does anybody feel like that? When is the other shoe going to drop? You know? And and so, I mean, even having to learn to be happy and joyful was a really big thing. But what God told me, the biggest thing that I had to learn was forgiveness. And so I'm going to take you through how he taught me. You can learn forgiveness in a lot of different ways. I'm just going to go through this as one process. This is maybe what we're going to go through with some of you today if you want to choose to stay afterwards and work through some of this stuff. But I'm going to show you what I went through. And it will be on the screen in three, two, one, five, four. (laughs) Do you want me to put it on? Okay, let's see. I think he's saying you've got to put it up there. So um, the, the biggest thing he taught me was forgiveness. And it was really interesting about forgiveness is he said I had to understand forgiveness on a, di- on a, on a lot of different levels. And, and um, one of the catalysts for me, what started that journey for me is I got invited to go to Australia with a woman that said she was going to kill herself. Saw Celebrating Life, we have a television show, Celebrating Life and Recovery, was watching that, suicidal. She found me on Facebook, um, man, would you come to my house? And so I found a church that said they would let me come speak, and I stayed at her house, flew into Australia, we, I went to her house. Her house was a mess, kids were out of control, and she was uh, suicidal. When I walked in to talk with her, we talked and talked and talked. And her kids went crazy the whole time. First time I ever heard the saying, my kids are feral. (laughs) Because I had no idea what that meant. 
But her kids were screaming, yelling, putting metal cupcake uh, containers in the microwave with dough in it, trying to make um, cupcakes, and it was popping, electricity kind of thing. And she would not break on contact with me. The whole time this craziness was going on, smoke coming from the microwave, she would say, I'm so glad you're here. Man, <laughs> I'm telling you, I wouldn't have made it. And I'm like with my eyes going... <laughs> you know, her younger son took a bag of shredded cheese, cut the top off, and he's like two years old, and just went, whoo, and he was letting the cheese fly all around us. And she's looking right at me like, this is life-changing for me. <laughs> you know, and and that's, would you pray for me that someday I get into ministry? And I'm thinking these kids are dying out of control. I mean, they're crazy. So I, I, I think I'm just going to go in the room. The, the house was being repaired, and there were door, no doorknobs on any of the doors. So I go in my room without the doorknob, and I, I just lay down, and I'm thinking, God, okay, this is crazy. It's out of control. I think the husband's just kind of escaped. He's depressed. She's going to kill herself. Kids are feral. And all the kids come in my room, Right? and decide to jump on the bed. And I'm thinking, I'm just going to pretend I'm asleep. <laughs> so they're jumping. They're jumping over the bed, running around, jumping on the bed, over the bed, running around. I'm an addict in recovery. I could pretend I'm asleep for hours. You're going to get really tired. So the kids jump, 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 jump. Finally, they got tired and left. I put my suitcase against the door. <laughs> you know, I'm thinking, God. And then finally, we go back and forth and back and forth. And she said again, will you pray for me with ministry? And I said, um, um, can I pray for you as a mother? Because I was your kids. And my heart breaks for them. Nobody saw me. Nobody knew how to love me. I wasn't getting cuddled by anyone, and my mom was suicidal and angry and buried in a book, you know. And, and I thought she was either going to kill me or we were going to heal. Because sometimes, you know, when you talk about somebody raising their kids, it's not an easy thing to do. But I just said, you know, I can't, I, I, I can't really pray for anything other than healing has to start there. And finally she cried, and we prayed for that. And it was amazing what God did to this family, for this family, and for this woman. She's now in ministry. Um, she, you'll hear her own story, but she just did a series called Beyond the Search. She's got her own um, uh, ministry, and her kids are doing well. It's a, it was amazing to watch God stand her up over the years. But when I went in the bathroom to get ready for that night at the church, because remember I said I got a church gig to get sponsored to go over there, and I'm getting ready, and I hear the Holy Spirit say, that was your mom, but she had five kids and no support. And I fell on the ground just crying. That was my mom. She was so disassociated. She didn't know how to love me. She didn't know how to respond to the intensity all around her. And she had nobody supporting her. And she was just a kid. And all she wanted to do was kill herself. And I, for the first time in my life, I had some level of the damage that she went through and that it wasn't about me, but I actually physically got to see it. So God takes me through a process, and he said, first of all, I want you to understand that to the level that I forgave you, I forgive all your junk. Every single thing that I bring to the table with God, and some of it's really dark on the streets. Some that were done to me and some that I did, and most of us as addicts know that we are not the innocent party here. But all that stuff, but everything I brought to God, he forgave. Every single thing, all the thoughts, all the secret sins, all the junk. Um, he said all the rebellion, all the hatred, all that stuff. He said, I forgive, and I don't remember it anymore right? And you got to get that. There's nothing that you can bring to me that I'm going to say, oh, so except for that. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And you got to get that. God chooses to focus on his desire to forgive us, right? Does he choose to focus on my behavior? No. He focuses on his desire to get us free, his desire to help our recovery, not whether I'm doing it right or wrong today. He said, my desire is for you to be healthy. My desire is for you to laugh. My desire is for you to be cuddled and learn to cuddle and love the people around you. That's his desire. So he said, you got to get that. 
One of the things I think is interesting is God chooses to love us in spite of ourselves. <laughs> Raise your hand if that's good news. <laughs> in spite of ourselves. You know what I mean? Because, you know, somebody said, um, well, how are you doing in your recovery? And I said, today, good. <laughs> you know, it's Sabbath. You know, you, but it's like every day we have to answer that question. And in spite of that, he said, every day I'm right with you. It took me 21 years to learn to trust because I didn't know how to do that. And God was patient, 21 years. I tried to work on every other issue, anger, depression, how to understand this. I'm teaching people in the inpatient psych how to do things. And he said, my biggest issue is I didn't know how to love and I didn't know how to trust. And he waited for me to learn that, 21 years. Um, so he said, his desire is for, to get me there. When we have a bitter attitude towards one another, we have to remember that. The extent that God forgives us, the extent that he loves us, the extent that he can change our lives, he's literally now going to ask us to do something, which is crazy. Um, he said, I want you to forgive the people who have deeply wounded you. Hold up. I'll forgive my banker. <laughs> I'll forgive you my hairdresser. Look at my hair right now. <laughs> I'll forgive her. But that, you know, forgive the people who deeply wounded you, who caused you the most damage in your life. And I'm thinking, I don't know. And, and, and he took me to the original teaching, the basic teaching in Christianity. That li that, and, and I think that this is so powerful. God said that because of the death of Christ, we're set free right? And we could do it any other way. I could choose to carry my own sins, but he said, because of the death of Christ, I don't have to do that. God covers me in the robe of righteousness. We daily work on my stuff, and he's heading home with me. And he said, I'll fulfill in you every promise I made every day. I'll sanctify, sanctify you. I will walk you in recovery. Uh, everything that you need to learn about your crazy thinking, all that kind of stuff, is I'll be faithful um, because of this because Christ died. So now he says, I want you to do the same level of forgiveness. First of all, the first person he mentioned to me was, who do you think? So mom, it was dad. I want you to forgive your father. So I want you to die to yourself and forgive your father. Because my father owes me something, I felt. You know, I was interfered with at three months old. I've never had a father. My father died in a crack house interfering with other kids. I have never looked at him and said, man, dad, can I tell you something or can I sit with you or whatever? He was never safe. But he said, he does owe you something. If he could give me a check, what would the check be for? For everything that you lost without, for me not being a dad? Let me just write you a check, hon. What would it be? There's no amount of money. Do you know what I mean? If I wreck your car, I can give you whatever. You probably have an expensive car. I could give you $80,000, right? Um, and we're done, right? But my dad can't do that. So he said, I want you to literally um, die to self and be free. The only other choice is I can carry all the bitterness, resentment, anger, and hatred with me to my last breath. And, and, and that would be my choice. I can surrender it by forgiveness or I can carry it. And so then I said, if that's true, I don't know how to do it. How do you do that? And so I'm going to tell you what he showed me on how to do it. And, and this is brilliant, literally brilliant, because it's not about the act anymore. It's not about the damage anymore. So I'm going to take it beyond the damage and follow me with that and try to think of your own thing um, but I'm going to show you a little bit about what I've seen. Forgiveness is really hard. And it's really hard when forgiveness, you're living with somebody that you're forgiving every single day. The Bible calls it forbearance. God forbears with us. I know that a lot of you guys don't um, feel that way, but God forbears with us every day. But when you're living with somebody that is acting out, that is causing you injury, even now, the text is really clear. It says forbear. Be gentle and forbearing with one another. Um, um, if one has given a grievance or complained against another, readily pardon or forgive. And forbearances for a while, I literally oversee that damage. 
or that abuse or whatever. And I'm not talking about women that are being beat. Be careful and keep yourself safe. But sometimes with our kids and our spouses and our people around us, we have to forbear with them. God forbears forbears with us. So this is a different kind of thing. But when um, something has happened in the past, we're going to talk about that right now. Um, I want you to imagine this um, block of color is whatever event you're thinking about. For me, it's um, um, my dad and him interfering with me, right? So whatever event you're thinking of, that's what that represents. And it could be anything. It could be abandonment. It could be physical abuse, sexual abuse, neglect, alcoholism, drug addiction, workaholism, religious addiction. Religious addiction is as damaging as drug addiction to the children. When somebody does religion addictively, it can injure everybody. And so whatever it is for you and where you got damaged, the damage is intense. And for a lot of us, when we forgive, we go back to the damage. I forgive my dad for interfering with me. And I do that a thousand times, maybe a thousand times a day, maybe a thousand times a year. But that's not where my damage is happening. And so I'm going to show you why that doesn't work is that the damage in addiction or in, in abuse is the damage happens, and the first thing I tell myself about the damage is a scheme. So when I was interfered with my dad, what do you think one of the first things I told myself? I'm not loved. I'm not worth anything. So I, I, I literally start um, with, I'm not loved. I'm not worth anything. I'll never have a father. Um, nobody will ever love me. Um, I only feel good when I do drugs. Um, the world is not safe. And I literally tell myself all kinds of stuff for the rest of my life. I wake up in the morning, and the very first thoughts I have are these. If I had a beep on, and every time I had a negative thought, it lit up, um, it would be crazy because most of us have these thoughts that come out from these events. And so the event no longer is the issue. The, the issue is that I believe the scheme and I am now the perpetrator, right? My dad no longer is even alive, and yet I wake up and tell myself this every day. So I want to say um, whose fault was the original injury? With my dad, whose fault? My dad's. Whose fault is the rest of this? Absolutely mine. And when, when we get into recovery, I have to get that. Not only forgiveness. With my dad, somebody gave me a baby shoe of my dad. One of those little white ones that lace up. And, and said, can you forgive your dad when he was a baby before he molested you? Can you forgive your mom when she was a baby before she was so damaged she couldn't love her own children? Do you know what I mean? At what level can I forgive? And then can I look at the schemes that were set up in my life because of the injury? What were the schemes? The Bible says to fight against the schemes of the enemy. What, what are schemes? What are they? What were they? And so the scheme for me was I'm not worth anything. I'll never be loved. I'll never be safe. And so the scheme plays out every single time I get injured. And so what God said is I want you to surrender the scheme and forgive the injury. And so the scheme is the, um, for me what was really important in my life. So I'm going to go on to the next. When forgiveness for my dad, I had to choose to forgive my dad. And I had to do that purposely. I choose to forgive my dad. I needed to count the cost of that and what does that actually mean. If I wreck your car again, let's say you have that $80,000 car. What color is it? Champagne. Champagne. Champagne color, of course. So I have that $80,000 car. Beautiful. I don't know how to drive in this country. I pull out the parking lot and I ran into your car, right? Oh, man, sorry. And you're like, sorry, really? Do you have insurance? Well, I'm in ministry. <laughs> Do you have any money? No. And he takes me to court because he needs to get his car paid, and they get a judgment against me, and he still gets no money. Five years later, we're still fighting this. Every time in the country, I have to dodge him. I have to hide from him because I owe him $80,000. And, you know, after about five years, six years, seven years, 
you need to fix your car and just go on because you know, I'm going to make you crazy the rest of your life. And so forgiveness in that sense is easy. But I have a girlfriend that somebody came in and shot all of her children in the face, killed each of her children. Her name is Joyce Swift. And they, she, they killed each of her children. The police thought she had done it, took them into interrogation for 12 to 16 hours. She never saw the bodies of her children, and it took her 11 years to say, I choose to forgive this kid that, that killed my ki um, children. And so there's a point where we have to say, I choose to forgive, understanding the full cost of that. Um, and I'm the only one that can. Like if I wanted to sell you my house, I'm the only one that can. He can't sell you my house. But when we start to forgive people that have injured us, I'm the only one on the planet that has the right to say, I forgive you. And when I say it, I have the right to then step away from all of the junk and confront all of the schemes that came from that. So when we, you talk about forgiveness and the people that have hurt us, I want you to just think about this is a prayer that somebody gave me, and I thought it was brilliant. But it says that, Lord, I choose to forgive, um, I choose to forgive my um, father for interfering with me, causing me to feel so worthless, causing me to feel unloved, causing me to feel such hatred, causing me to feel that no men on the planet are safe. No one is safe, right? Causing me to feel insecure and disconnected. I choose to forgive him for that. And I'm willing to pay for the pain and the consequences that he caused me. I'm willing. He can't write a check, but I'm the only other person that said I'm willing to do that. I'm willing to say, okay, um, I'll take that on. And I ask you, any scheme that the enemy set up in my life, any, anything, any lie, man, break that. Break that. What is the lies that I believe because of that? I believe that I was not like anybody else. I was a damaged kid from the very beginning. Not true. I believe from in the womb, I was a bad seed. And God said, not true, not true. So I had to surrender all that kind of stuff. And, and I ask you, and this is the next thing that's so important to me, is that um, anything that the devil set up in my life because of my anger or unforgiveness, I ask you to break. And I ask you, Lord Jesus, to take back the ground that I lost with all those years. Raise your hand if you lost more than a year to some unforgiveness issue. How about two years? Five years. How about 20 years? Some people, I won't talk with this girl, who lost 80 years. 80 years. And so to me, God said the blood of Christ never asked us to go 80 years with this stuff. So it's like being able to say, take back the ground that I gave. Replace in me the innocence and the laughter and the ability to do all that kind of stuff that was robbed from me because of someone else's addictions. And let me forgive them and give all of that to you. Because I can't carry it. I give all of that to you. And as soon as I got that, not in a superficial sense, but as soon as I got that in a real sense, I can't even tell you I was free. Unbelievable. Literally walking away knowing that I'm no longer going to be the perpetrator. I'm no longer going to beat myself up with all of those lies. And I'm going to ask God every day through the Holy Spirit, what is the truth about who I am? And you know what he told me? This is ridiculous, and I promise you I'll send you to lunch with this. But what he told me, which was absolutely ridiculous, is you are a beautiful child of God, beloved beyond what you can imagine. And if you trust me, I will show you who you are because you don't know. And I shook because I thought, you know what? I don't know how to be healthy or beautiful. And he just said, trust me. So I walk in away from all of that damage and all of that stuff into the arms of God that says, let me show you because you have believed lies your whole life. And so for people that are going to do some of this work today, forgiveness work, raise your hand if you thought about someone that you could forgive. Okay, so if anybody wants to do the work with us personally, we just, man, we'd be delighted. If anybody wants to do an anointing with that, and that's just a special prayer for healing, that God join you with your healing emotionally, um, that's fine. What the pastor's going to do is close the meeting um, with prayer for all of us. Because stand up if you even say, you know what, I, I don't know if I want to stay over, but I want to choose to forgive. Stand up, anybody. There's got to be someone. 
All right. So literally saying that we'll do a special prayer for that. Because I, I believe all of us have that sense that we, there are people that have injured us in our lives. There's broken marriages. There's dysfunction. There's even stuff that happens in the church sometimes. All of that kind of stuff. And we have to forgive. Um, spouses that are crazy. Like my husband married me. Poor thing. <laughs> He'd be standing on the pew right now. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, all of us have something. And so the pastor's going to come up. We're going to, oh, wait, I'm going to show a video first. And this is my favorite video. It's only a couple minutes. And then, Pastor, can you close in prayer? Okay. One of the things about forgiveness is I, I was able to forgive my father before he died. 
He never came back into my life because of his addiction, and he never held my child, which was a grief that I can't even tell you how huge it was. So forgiveness sometimes doesn't mean reconciliation. It doesn't mean any of that kind of stuff, but it does mean that you stop believing the lies that you live with. And so forgiveness is a key to recovery. It is so important. And sometimes, especially, I, I meet men that never had that relationship with their father, and they have to walk around and kind of do all the stuff without the strength that they needed. And so for them even to say, I choose to forgive and literally let God show you who you are outside of that damage. And for us, this is the key to recovery. The first step in recovery is to receive forgiveness. There's a God that's bigger than me, that can look at all my stuff and forgives me, can literally walk me back into my own skin. But there's also the next step is that to offer that same forgiveness to the people around us. Some relationships will be fully restored when we do that, and some won't be because of the damage within that relationship. So it's really about um, looking at all that kind of stuff, but it's never about withholding forgiveness. I choose to pay your debt, and God has paid mine, and he said, let me just take it from you, but I'm, I, I'm not going to let it free float around the room anymore. I can't, um, I can't do that. I can't keep beating myself up. I can't keep believing these lies. I'm an incredible woman of God, filled with the Holy Spirit, and I delight to be alive. But that was not true when I was bitter and angry, when I was lost in unforgiveness. And so the, one of the things that the blood of Christ gives us, or that God gives us, that is so amazing, is the ability to repent, to receive forgiveness, and to forgive. And once we get that, man, healing is unbelievable, unbelievable. And I'm going to um, switch places with you. There's an amazing song that's so well known. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. In a moment, we're going to sing that song. But before then, I just want you to pray. We'll pray together. And uh, while I'm praying, if there is someone that has come to mind, some event that has come to mind, just in your thoughts, would you choose this morning to hand that over to God and say, you know what, Jesus? I no longer want to live every day in the past. Today, I want to let that go. And I don't know how that happens. I'm just going to choose it. And I'm asking you to do that for me. So let's pray together. Father God, this world is just so full of this thing called pain, so full of this thing called injustice so full of this thing called suffering. It is the reason why you find this thing called sin so intolerable. Because there is not a single choice we can make that affects only us. Every time we make a dumb decision, somebody else suffers to some extent. And in a crowd this big, there are some of us who have suffered because of other people's choices. And we're stuck. Because it hurts. And it was wrong. And it shouldn't have happened. Why us? Why me? Today, Jesus, we want to make the choice to hand this to you. Our story, our pain, and our suffering. We need you to do something in us. Because some of us have tried a thousand times to ignore it, forget it, move past it, but it's it just follows us around. We've tried to medicate it. We've tried to work, work harder to, 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 to stop thinking about it. We've tried to distract ourselves. We've tried to escape. But every time it's quiet, 
Every time that temporary solution comes to an end, there it is again. That moment, that memory, that experience, that event, that person. Today we want to be free. And so it is our prayer, Jesus, that today, as we choose right now, in the quietness of our thoughts and our hearts, as we make the choice that you would grant the experience. You are the master of forgiveness, and we see you hanging upon a cross because of our sin, laying down your life to exchange places with the perpetrators of evil so that we could live again. Would you accomplish that in us today so that we too would release those who have sinned against us? Forgive us and enable us to be forgivers. Heal us, Jesus. For we pray this this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Invite our song team to come forward.